Hey, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I was saying this uh, at the earlier 8 a.m. service, but each time the lights turn on and I get to see all your faces, it just makes me so happy. So um, thank you for joining us, whether you're in person or online. Uh, as Wes mentioned, my name is Dan, and I'm our discipleship pastor. And today I've got an awesome opportunity to share from God's word today as we continue throughout the book of Acts. But like Wes mentioned, I just wanted to fill in a little bit of the details in that Serbia trip. Um, and so for all of you who had been praying for us, like, thank you. It really made an incredible difference. Um, the Lord was doing some amazing things that surpassed all of our expectations. Um, the ministry landscape, the faith landscape in Serbia is very different than what we have here. And our role as a team was to go and provide support, putting festivals together for small villages and communities that are very under-resourced in that way. And just to give you an idea of what God was doing, uh, the second festival that we did was in an area that had not um, had this kind of experience. Uh, the ministry teams wanted to plant a church there, but this was a litmus test. If we could just see 75 kids and their families, and maybe there's room for us to plant a church in this village. So we get there, we set up, half an hour goes into it, 75 kids are already there. <laughs> 15 minutes pass by, we've got over 100. By the time the event ended, we had 311 kids um, along with their family show up, and it was amazing. Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. So God was on the move. Their ministry leaders are encouraged, and lives are being changed. So thank, thank you again for your support. Um, well, as we get started, would you join me again for just a brief moment of prayer? Lord, thank you for today, and God, I just feel so honored and privileged to be able to be with fellow brothers and sisters in this space and thank you for your presence. Uh, we know that you are here. And so we ask for you to be at work, God, in our lives. Speak in and through me um, that your words would come deep into our hearts, that we would receive it, and that you would allow it to grow and flourish for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but I've served as a witness in a courtroom only once in my life. It was back my freshman year at JMU where I had to testify against my sweet mate. And so going into the courtroom that day, I remember the details of being sworn in, right? Swearing to tell the truth. But for better or for worse, that came very naturally to me uh, over the events that had happened just a few weeks prior. So at the time, I was living in a suite style dorm, which meant that there were three individual rooms connected to a shared living area. And it was during the week, so not a weekend, it was during the week, and my sweet mates and I had just finished watching a game, a basketball game on the TV. And so we were all wrapping up, going into our rooms, I had an early class that I was trying to make, because that wasn't a great habit of mine. <laughs> um, so I was trying to go to bed, um, my roommate Stu is off trying to do his chem homework, and we're just winding down. But then about an hour later, right around midnight, one of our other sweet mates, Joe, barges into the suite, turns on the TV, maxes out the volume, and starts to have an obnoxiously loud phone conversation right there in the living area. And so Stu and I, my roommate, I'm making eye contact, rolling her eyes, praying that Joe would wrap it up quickly, but he didn't. <laughs> and it seemed to go on forever until I lost my patience. So I get out of bed, open the door, I'm like, Joe, come on, man, what the heck? Go, get, go to your room. I literally told my sweet mate to go to his room. So the dude was on his phone, and he goes, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to call you back. <laughs> so he hangs up. He walks into his room, closes the door. Everything is back to normal for a little bit. Because not long after that, I hear a loud <laughs> bangs and crashes and ah, yelling and screaming. And Joe is just going nuts for a solid two minutes. Now, two minutes doesn't sound like much, but if the entire time... He's smacking his walls with an un unidentified object. It gets old real quick. So then we're like, oh, my gosh. And so we come out of our room. Our other sweet mates come out of their rooms. We're at his door. And we're like, Joe, calm down, man. Take it easy. And it's just crazy, right? To make matters a little bit more interesting, the door to our suite, there's someone there. Hey, guys, what's going on? It's Luke. Sure enough, we open the door, and it's Luke a six-foot-three red-haired athlete who wants to know what is going on. He's looking for answers. And we're like, sorry, man. Like, Joe's in there. He's totally lost it. And so Luke goes over to Joe's door and he's like, hey, man. Says a few colorful things. <laughs> and he's like, whatever. So he turns around to leave. And that's when Joe's door finally opens. 
and we make eye contact. And I see that he's lunging at me with his hockey stick over his head. He takes a swing, but it catches the top of his door and gets stuck. Then Joe comes out into the living area with that hockey stick and swings again. But at that point, I have enough time to dodge it. But guess who didn't dodge it? Luke. And so, long story short, uh, Luke finds himself in an ambulance. Joe finds himself in a police car. And my sweet mates and I end up in court testifying to these events a few weeks later. Um, parents, this is not the normal freshman year experience. Um, so, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Just felt like I had to throw that out there. But, you know, being a witness in that scenario wasn't particularly difficult, nor was it complicated for me. I mean, recalling the events of that evening came pretty naturally, right? And so we're in the book of Acts, and we're looking at the lives of Peter and the early church, the apostles, right? People who had been with Jesus, and apparently they didn't have a difficult time both recalling the events and the experiences that they've had, and, of course, they then had the willingness to share all about those accounts so that's where we are today. First, I wanted to do a little bit of uh, word defining, and so I'm looking up the word witness on Google. And so a definition that Google suggested is that a witness is someone who sees an event take place or someone who is able to furnish proof. Pretty solid definition. Now, of course, when we start talking about uh, legal definitions, things get a bit more nuanced. But for the sake of today, my working definition of what a witness is, is it's someone who has a measure of knowledge from personal observation and experience, right? Personal observation and experience. The book of Acts has a total of 28 chapters, and today we're only in the fifth chapter. But so much has already happened with the arrival and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit in the lives of his people. The miraculous is happening. Things are wild. God is empowering his people and his church. But... The expansion of God's kingdom isn't without opposition. There's opposition. And in the midst of it, God doesn't tell them to slow down or to stop or to take a break. Instead, God's charge to Peter and the other apostles was to serve as witnesses to God, to who he is and what he's done. And so by extension for us today, I feel that that charge is for all of us, God's people that we might also do likewise. So we're picking things up in the fifth chapter, and I wanna read a solid chunk of this passage for two reasons. One, Acts, generally speaking, reads like a narrative or novel, and so it'll feel pretty good, I think. And then secondly, I love it when we allow scripture to speak for itself. And so Acts chapter five, starting with verse 17, uh, let's check it out. Quick context, Peter and the apostles have been doing the miraculous through God's spirit, right? So verse 17, then, as a result of the miraculous, the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. And this is the main verse for today's passage, verse 20. It says, go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Going on, verse 21. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, uh, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Awkward. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Someone's getting fired. Verse 25, then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force, however, because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Uh, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. 
The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Oof, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He, too, was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Mm, Wise words. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Ouch. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, the name of Jesus. <laughs> day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the one who saves. Amen. So this is quite the series of events. As a result of living and walking by the Spirit of God, Peter and the others are thrown into jail, probably with the intent to have them questioned or even sentenced. But before that can happen, God comes to the rescue, sending an angel to not just open the doors, but to lead them out. That sequence of miraculous freedom happens throughout the book of Acts, where people like the Sadducees and and, and these important religious leaders try to bind up, lock up, and keep the apostles away from the rest of the world. But God sets them free. God makes a way. I would even suggest that that work of bringing freedom to people is still active for you and I. But as often is the case, God issues a charge for those that have encountered his presence and his power. The freedom that Peter and the apostles experienced was connected to this command, to what? To go now and tell the people all about this new life. In other words, go and be witnesses to these things. Peter and the apostles weren't just set free so that they could scurry off and cower in fear in some corner. They weren't set free so that they could eventually turn face from God and say, all right, I've had enough, clocking out, I'm done. They didn't even go and sign up for some witness protection program. Witness protection? To heck with that, right? It's probably what they were thinking. They continued to have the words of God in their hearts just as they did a chapter earlier. In Acts chapter four, verse 20, they say this, As for us, we cannot cannot help to speak about what we have seen and heard. They couldn't help themselves. And so that charge to go and to be a witness, to go and to tell all the people is also for us. If you and I have experienced or observed God, we are meant to go and be witnesses to the world. Now, people, uh, myself included, sometimes wonder about what God is able and willing to do through his spirit today. So what I mean is when we look at Jesus in the gospel accounts, we see that he is doing the miraculous left and right. And with each event, his heart is that he is trying to help affirm the truth that he indeed is the son of God while also building up the faith of the people. And then after Jesus ascends, 
Here in the book of Acts, the early church, Peter and the apostles are doing likewise, the miraculous, things that can't be explained apart from God. And so people will say different things about what happens today, but I for one believe that if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in me, if this is the same spirit that empowered the believers of the early church, then I think there's some room for God to do the impossible today, amen? But that said, when we look at the book of Acts, but also throughout scripture, I think one clear indicator of the presence of God, of his Holy Spirit, is the boldness seen in his people, particularly in moments of opposition and persecution. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Esther in the Old Testament, who was queen, right, to the most powerful man in the known world, and she risks her life to hopefully save her people. And it was boldness that what was required through God's spirit. So there's Esther. I also think about a guy named Daniel and his three friends, compadres, and associates. All four of them actually entered into the execution that was meant to end them. But if you read some of the conversation that took place before, these people were willing to die for their God rather than bowing their knees to a false idol. The Holy Spirit at work bringing boldness to his people. And then here in Acts, by the time it's Acts chapter 5, Peter has already twice given a bold proclamation to the crowds. And twice moreover was Peter put on trial. But in all four instances, Peter is not pulling any punches. He is sharing boldly about who God is and what he has done. Even if it comes at his own expense, even if it puts him in danger, and even if it gives his opponents an opportunity to also receive life and purpose through Jesus Christ. I mean, let's think about that for a second, these things for a second. A witness can be ineffective if they choose not to share the truth. And we've seen this both in real life situations, but also in fiction, right, like movies or TV shows. There are witnesses who refuse to testify or instead give a false account for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're afraid of the implications of testifying, right? Or maybe they feel that stating the truth would benefit the other side. Or maybe telling the truth would actually hurt someone they care about. And of course, sometimes there are outside factors, people that are trying to manipulate the outcome either through threats or through bribery. But Peter and the others were not being held hostage to any of this because ultimately they found safety and security in their relationship with God and their understanding of who God is. To them, God was and is the ultimate authority. So whether we're talking about the courtroom or at work, whether in home or in a hospital, whether in life or in death, they knew that God had the final word. And this good news that anyone could come into a right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, wasn't just meant for a little group of people or one group of people. It was meant for everyone, including the people that were trying to squish out the very life from Peter and his friends. It didn't stop them from sharing. So then it's only through God's spirit that we also then can have that level of boldness, particularly in the face of of opposition and persecution. So here's a question question for us, a question for you. Will you ask, will you ask for boldness as you are an effective witness for the Lord? In the previous chapter, in Acts chapter four, verse 29, the apostles know they can't do it themselves and so they are seen uttering a prayer that says, Lord, enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness not just boldness, but with great boldness. And then, of course, here in chapter five, we see them being empowered by his spirit. You know, here's another reason that I think that Peter and the others were such an effective witness. Similar to me, back at JMU, they couldn't forget what they had experienced. In the past few weeks, we've seen a little bit of Peter's backstory, right? Particularly with Jesus, and that's incredibly significant. Peter was essentially riding shotgun to Jesus for three years. 
Peter felt like he was on top of the world. But the dude dropped the ball big time during Jesus' final and darkest hours, denying Jesus three times. Denied any affiliation, let alone friendship with Jesus. And so while that experience took place in a different time, it was a very similar kind of trial where it put Peter's self-interest at odds with his relationship with Christ. And in that occasion, Peter's self-interest and desire for self-preservation went out. And then, praise the Lord, Jesus rises from the dead and he starts meeting his people. And in the last chapter of John's gospel, we see that Jesus calls the disciples to him after having provided breakfast on the seashore. It's a very intimate moment, one that's probably surprising to the apostles, to the early disciples. And in those moments, Jesus essentially reaffirms Peter, his love for him, but also reaffirms the call that Peter has to go and to serve Christ and to build his church. With that in mind, I think we see that Peter has be- who Peter has become is significant because at this point, he can't deny or stay silent about who God is. Uh-uh, he's not doing that again, right? He's not gonna deny and say, I know nothing of this man. No, it's the exact opposite. The game changer being the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. So similarly, for you and I, who have we become and what have we experienced that would allow us to be, again, a witness for God? You know, these events for Peter and the others didn't just happen years ago. They were from moments ago. In other words, these were fresh. I had a friend in grad school. He would often ask me different questions to challenge me, right, to keep me going. And he would ask me questions like, Dan, when's your last experience with God? Is it from the last few months or, or is it from the last week, <laughs> right? This idea that, hey, if you're having a healthy, thriving relationship with God, maybe there's something fresh happening. Tell me about it, right? Always challenging me. These questions are good while being challenging. So here's one for you again. Are the ways in which you are observing and experiencing God coming from long ago or from moments ago? If you're like me and you find yourself with a desire to grow more, in your experience and observation of who God is, there's great news and great hope for all of us. I don't know if you know this or not, but God wants you to know him more. It's not just like an eternal game of hide and seek (laughs) where, where, where God is just having the time of his life hiding from you and you're like, where the heck are you, God? Right? He doesn't get a kick out of that. The book of Acts is a testament to this. God's sending his spirit so that the rest of the world would know more about who he is and this good news. In fact, that's all of scripture. And you know what? I don't think God wants us to fake it till we make it. I don't think he wants us to give a false account about where we happen to be with God, thinking that it does God any favors. And here's a thought. God doesn't need a PR department. <laughs> He doesn't need you and I to write or create a fluff piece just to bolster his public image. But what he does desire is truth because he knows that the most effective witness is a truthful one. So what does he do? He extends an invitation to you. He extends invitations to me. The fact that you are here with us right now is a testament to this. Whether you know it or not, Spirit of God at the door to your heart saying, hey, this is me. Hey, this is me. Will you open up that much more? He's pursuing you. We sang songs earlier that spoke to God's heart to pursue us with mercy and with love. But just like any healthy relationship, there needs to be a level of mutual reciprocity and engagement for it to go anywhere good, right? So there's opportunities for all of us. But if you do desire more, I just want to offer three things to consider I suggest these things uh, as you go about your days in the next few, uh, next few weeks. Three things, if you desire more. One, so simply confess. What do I mean by that? Just tell the truth to God about where you're at. Maybe you feel distant. Maybe you're disappointed, frustrated, confused, 
Or maybe you're just like, God, I just simply haven't cared that much. You know what? I think God wants to hear that. I think he wants to receive that because that's the truth of where you're at. Use your heart, use your mind, use your voice, pray and let him know these things. Just come to him as you are, AKA confess. Two, then to ask. Ask for what, Dan? For anything. (laughs) Ask him for help. Ask him for understanding, for faith. Ask him to help you see him that much more clearly. Whatever comes to mind, ask. The Lord wants to hear what it is that's on your heart. And then when you've done these two things, when you've confessed, when you've been honest about where you are, when you present your heart and your request, requests to him by asking him, the last thing to do is to observe. To observe. Have an open posture and start to take in. Be on the lookout for what God might be trying to say to you, do with you, in you. And in so doing, we see that the words that Jesus offers in Luke eleven ten 10 are true. And this is what he says. He says, for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. It's a promise. It sets our expectations. So if we come to him as we are, when we ask and then we observe, we're bound to begin to take hold of who God is and what he's doing. And then if you're part of the group of people who you feel like you have observed and experienced God, or if you've moved from this side now and you're, you're understanding, you're observing and you're experiencing, I'm gonna offer these next three suggestions for you to consider. The first, express gratitude. Give thanks, AKA worship. Another way of me thinking about worship is it's an opportunity that happens when God acts or when he reveals our response to that can be worship, right? So if he's doing things in your lives, respond with a heart of gratitude saying, thank you, Lord, you are good. And secondly, is also to ask. But ask for what? Ask for ideas to share this truth. Ask for ways for God to set up situations to share about what you've seen, what you've observed, and what you've experienced. And finally, this is the go and tell part. (laughs) Be on the lookout for opportunities to share not by kicking down doors, not by standing on a street corner, not by just going, ah, and being, you know, over the top about it. I mean, if that's what God wants you to do, go for it. (laughs) But maybe it's more subtle than that. Maybe it's more natural and organic than that. Maybe it's within the relationships that you already have, and maybe we just haven't been dialed in, right? So after we thank God and we ask for ways for God to open doors, let's go and tell On a practical level, a great place to do this is within your groups. So here at Hope, we've got a number of different groups, right, small groups. And if you need practice, because you know what? This takes practice. It takes doing things over and over again. If you're not accustomed to having conversations, talking about what you think God is saying and doing, it could feel a little bit unique, maybe even awkward. But in the safety and in the friendship and network of relationships in your groups, this is a great place to ask questions like, hey, again, what do you feel like the Lord is doing in your life? What have you observed God doing? What are some of the prayers of your heart? So I'd ask you to consider those three things. You know, there's this dynamic that uh, when how we live aligns with the words we speak, credibility goes up exponentially. But the reverse is true. In other words, if you see me here in this setting saying, doing a few things, Then you go to Kroger the next day and you're like, Dan? (laughs) Right? That's a mismatch. (laughs) But when we are able to authentically share about ways in which God has been active in your life, in ways that surpass our own capacities, that's where all the room for God to receive glory is, right? It reminds me of what Paul says, the Apostle Paul, in a letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says these words. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Why? So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So if that means that I need to experience different measures of deficit in my life, things that I simply cannot do, it's gonna be okay. In fact, it works to the advantage of being able to highlight that much more of what God can do Amen? 
And here's the last point, and hopefully this is encouraging to all of us. What happens after we share, we're not responsible for. You see that? Peter, right, all the times that he shared boldly, I mean, this is some good news. There's some powerful miracles accompanied with what he's saying and doing. And yet there were many people that didn't say yes to Jesus. I mean, clearly he's been flogged a number of times already. But what does Peter do? Does he like, you know, throw a fit and storm out? Does he try to like shake some sense into them? No, because he recognizes that the interchange of the heart lies within God's territory alone. Simply, our role is simply then to go and tell, to go and tell. So whatever you've personally observed or experienced with God, that's what he is asking and calling us to share. Being a witness doesn't have to be hard, doesn't have to be complicated. So just as the angel said to Peter and the apostles, I believe that God through his spirit is saying to us today, which is go and tell the people all about this new life. Let's pray. God, I'm grateful for who you are and just the greatness and magnitude of your heart. God, you do great things. You're always on the move, bringing life to dark places, restoring us, making things new. And with all of that, you have the next person in mind. Your heart is one that desires to have a big family, one that's continually expanding for the good news, for this new life to be shared and passed along from one person to the other. And so Lord, through the power and the presence of your spirit in our lives, would we contribute to that work? However small or little or big that it may seem, we ask for your spirit, for your boldness to give us what it takes to share. Thank you for your faithful to us. You don't turn away from me in my darkest. And so Lord, would we have a level of commitment, um, of drive, and just an openness, Lord, to be faithful to you. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.